I'll be very brief. This is just uh, I want to introduce our key speaker who's with us this evening. And uh, let me tell you, you must all be wondering, this is the inaugural dinner, actually. This should have happened yesterday. <laughs> Why is it happening today? The answer is very simple. Shashi only gave us time today. <laughs> so that's how you have the inaugural dinner on day one. And welcome to all of you. Uh, welcome, Shashi, for being here with us. Uh, Shashi really needs no introduction. Uh, most of you would be knowing him. He is in active politics, and he's a man of many, many, many parts. A diplomat, a scholar, an author. Not only that, for those of you who are cricket fans, if there's anything ever to know about cricket, I know Americans don't understand cricket, but if ever you want to understand anything about cricket, he's the man to go to. But, you know, most importantly, he is brought to the drab world of Indian politics, a glamour quotient, which is matched perhaps only by Bollywood. <laughs> and I say that, you know, and I say that because, uh, you know, if you, if, you, if you watch Twitter, his followers, his followership is 1.25 million. There's very little competition there. There are only two competitors. Guess who they are? Shah Rukh Khan, Priyanka Chopra. Priyanka Chopra and Shah Rukh Khan. <laughs> no, but most importantly, you see, his writings and comments uh, on Indian politics have generated so much interest amongst the young, amongst the youth. And this is a measure of that. So you have youth watching current affairs, youth following current affairs. And this is what he's brought to Indian politics, which did not exist. Uh, Dr. Shashi Tharoor, as we know him, I mean, he holds a PhD from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, uh, Tufts University, and he you know, founded the very famous Fletcher Forum of International Affairs, was the first editor. It's a journal which has continued for 33 years since then, and is still going strong. 36? I stand corrected. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Shashi has had, you know, a 30 year long, I mean, distinguished career with the United Nations. And finally, I mean, he joined with the UNHCR, and, but finally left it in 2007 after 30 years as Under Secretary General to join the rough and tumble world of Indian politics. He's now a member of parliament from uh, Thiruvananthapuram. And then he became Minister of State for External Affairs. But one thing about Shashi, he's always been known to call a spade a spade. So even as he continues in active politics, he is determined to stay on it on his own terms. He will not have those terms dictated by anybody. He is a person, you know, capable of straddling different diverse worlds at the same time, and he has a unique ability, the amazing ability, which we admire, to be you know, able to interconnect and then articulate very, very diverse experiences. Diverse experiences, diverse opinions. The result is, we all know he's a prolific author. He's written about 12 books. And these have got translated into almost every major European language besides Marathi and Malayalam. He continues to contribute to the New York Times, the Washington Post. I mean, you can list the journals and the, art, the papers he writes for. He's very widely read. And naturally, he would be a favorite on the international lecture circuit. Um, so, and he has been carrying to audiences across the world narratives about India's transformation, India's future prospects, He's talked about freedom of the press, about human rights, literacy, and India's role in emerging global politics. But we at ORF, and I personally, know Shashi is a great friend and patron of our foundation. 
He's a person we never hesitate to reach out to whenever we need anything. And he has been dean of our forum for global governance, which is a policy school we've created for young leaders. But our reason for having him here tonight is because he's actually deeply interested in the subject of this entire conversation, this entire conference. That is the Indian Ocean region. As Minister of State for External Affairs, he was instrumental in placing this region at the forefront of India's strategic calculations. And actually, you know, he can count amongst the heads of states of the literal states in the Middle East and Africa, many, many, many personal friends. So he brings, you know, a perspective which with an amazing sensitivity for the concerns of these states, for the concerns of the people, and that is really the reason why we have him here. Over to you, Shashi. Mother would have believed. <laughs> Pretty my wife isn't here. She might think better of me if she'd heard all of this. But thank you very, very much uh, for, that, for that introduction. You know, I, I suspect that uh, Sanjay did most of this by looking me up on the internet or getting someone to do so. It's, it's a great danger these days when you're addressing uh, new audiences is that people feel they have to find something to say about you. And uh, he, he clearly found a lot of nuggets. Uh, I won't disclaim any of them. But there are people who... Um, go very far. I knew a guy in New York who would look people up on the internet and then look up sins of omission and commission up the family tree, you know, the deeds of parents and grandparents and uncles and aunts. And on one occasion he found that his speaker had an uncle who was electrocuted at Sing Sing prison for kidnapping an armed robbery or something equally horrible. But having taken the trouble to look this up, he felt he had to use it. So he said, uh, our distinguished speaker uh, had an uncle who occupied the chair of applied electricity at one of the nation's leading institutions. <laughs> Which is just my way of saying that, you know that uh, whenever they find things, they have to find some nice way of saying these things. I, I noticed the various, the various disasters in my recent career that he glossed over so gently. I won't, I won't uh, underscore them, but it shows that the, the Sanjay Joshi School of Introductions is, is a good one. Thank you, sir. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, I'm, I'm delighted that, uh, that you were able to accommodate me for a late dinner instead of, instead of yesterday. Um, undoubtedly, knowing the quality of the food here, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's probably some relief for your waistline. Otherwise, you would have had two dinners instead of just the one today. But um, the Indian Ocean is a subject, as Anjoy said, that I've been uh, interested in and thinking about a bit. And uh, though I, I, I'm afraid the fate of my initiative in government uh, on that area may or may not be what we would all have wished. The fact is that there is some serious thinking about this issue, and I'm going to start uh, my remarks this evening, if I may, not with a reference to the U.S. at all, though I realize this is an Indo-U.S. dialogue, but to a Chinese admiral, one who sailed the waters of the Indian Ocean six centuries ago. In 1410, near the Sri Lankan coastal town of Gaul, the extraordinary Chinese explorer, Zhang He, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Admiral Zhang He, erected a stone tablet with a message to the world. His inscription was in three languages, Chinese, Persian, and Tamil, I hasten to say to my North Indian friends. And his message was even more remarkable. According to Robert Kaplan's 2010 book, Monsoon, it invoked the blessings of the Hindu deities for a peaceful world built on trade. 600 years ago, a Chinese sailor statesman called upon Indian gods as he set out to develop commercial links with the Middle East and East Africa through the Indian subcontinent and the Indian Ocean. Now, the subcontinent has long been at the center of Asia's most vital trade routes, and India's commanding position at the heart of South Asia gives it a special interest in safeguarding the prosperity of the Indian Ocean. Zhang He's traveled 600 years ago stand as a reminder of the economic potential of the vast waters of the Indian Ocean, which wash the shores of dozens of countries, large and small, that straddle half the globe, account for half the planet's container traffic, and carry two-thirds of its petroleum. But far more interesting, perhaps, are the strategic implications of the Indian Ocean region. Kaplan, whom I've already mentioned in his book Monsoon, 
um, came up with the premise that the greater Indian Ocean from the Horn of Africa to Indonesia, and I'm quoting him here, may comprise a map as iconic to the new century as Europe was to the last one. And demographically and strategically be a hub of the 21st century world. Now, as an American analyst, he argues that this makes the Indian Ocean the essential place to contemplate the future of US power. Perhaps that's what President Obama was doing in early November 2010 as he flew from India to Indonesia and contemplated the vastness of the ocean beneath. But surely it's even more vital for India to see its eponymous ocean as the locus of its own strategic power calculations. Uh, from an Indian point of view, though, the, um, strategic, the strategic importance of an ocean at whose central point our subcontinent stands is easy enough to grasp. The Indian Ocean is vital to us as the place through which most of our trade is conducted, keeping it safe from the depredations of pirates or the dominance of foreign navies, hostile foreign navies, is indispensable to our national security. Our coastlines represent both points of engagement with the world and places of vulnerability to attack from abroad, as we saw most recently on 2611, when this very hotel was attacked by people crossing a corner of the Indian Ocean. What should we be doing about it? Now, one way of dealing with the Indian Ocean is to see it through a security prism, and that I'm sure you're doing at part of your conference here, and I'm sure our Defense Ministry and our Navy in particular are working very hard on that. The invention of the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium that brought together over 50 countries to talk about the Indian Ocean is testimony to that. Another way, though, is to see the Indian Ocean's potential for constructive diplomatic action. And since uh, I have no intention of trying to cover the vast ground that all of you will be covering in the course of this meeting, I thought I would focus on just this aspect this evening in my remarks. I'm happy to address questions uh, afterwards. I am a believer in constructive diplomatic engagement across the Indian Ocean through a sub-regional organization that India did a great deal to start and needs to do a lot more to sustain. So let me ask all the experts here, what international association brings together 18 countries straddling three continents, thousands of miles apart, united solely by their sharing of a common body of water? That's a quiz question likely to stump the most devoted aficionado of global politics, obviously not the people in this room. It is, as many of you know, the Indian Ocean Rim, Rim Countries Association for Regional Cooperation, blessed with the unwieldy acronym IORARC, which bids fair to be the most extraordinary international grouping no one's ever heard of. <laughs> now, the association manages to unite Australia and Iran, Singapore and India, Madagascar and the United Arab Emirates, and a dozen other states, large and small, unlikely partners brought together solely by the fact that the Indian Ocean washes their shores. As India's Minister of State for External Affairs in 2009, I attended their ministerial meeting in Sana'a, Yemen, and despite being used to my eyes glazing over at the alphabet soup of international organizations I've encountered during a three-decade UN career, I did find myself excited by the potential of this one. Now, regional associations have been created on a variety of premises. Geographical, as with the African Union. Geopolitical, as with the Organization of American States. Economic and commercial, as with ASEAN or Mercosur. Security-driven, as with NATO. There are multi-continental ones, too, like IBSA, which brings together India, Brazil, and South Africa, or the better-known G20. And even Goldman Sachs can claim to have invented an intergovernmental body since the brick they wrote about, the concept coined by that Wall Street firm, was then reified by a meeting of the heads of government of these four countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, in Yekaterinburg in 2009, and has continued since, with South Africa joining the party, joining the group in 2011. But it's fair to say there's nothing quite like IORARC in the annals of global diplomacy. For one thing, there isn't another ocean in, on the planet that takes in three continents, Asia, Africa, and Oceania, and could embrace Europe too, since the French department, département of Réunion in the Indian Ocean, gives Paris observer status in the IORARC, and some people in the Quai d'Orsay were seriously considering seeking full membership at one time. 
For another, every one of Huntington's famously clashing civilizations finds a representative amongst the members of this organization, giving a common roof to the widest possible area of worldviews in their smallest imagine imaginable combination, just 18 countries. When IORARC meets, new windows are opened between countries separated by distance as well as by politics. Malaysians talk to Mauritians, Arabs with Australians, South Africans with Sri Lankans, Iranians with Indonesians. The Indian Ocean serves as both a sea separating them and a bridge linking them together. Now I can well imagine the skepticism in this room uh, and I, I will address that in a few minutes because I too have seen the reality and I've been speaking so far about the potential. But since we have Indians and Americans in the room, this may be the right moment to digress slightly in the interest of making a larger point uh, and share with you my favorite story of Indo-American dialogue. This goes back to the 1960s when, when uh, America was advising us in agriculture before our Green Revolution. And the story goes that um, an American agricultural expert landed in India and uh, was greeted warmly by a hospitable Indian farmer. And the Indian farmer, of course, thanks to our population pressures and our land reforms, each Indian farmer has a pretty small bit of land, not much larger perhaps than the, the lobby of the hotel we're in, maybe smaller. But he said very proudly to the American, you know, my land goes all the way up to there. And the American looked, he said, do you see that national highway, says the Indian. The American looks, he sees a dirt road. But the, 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 the Indian farmer is very proud. He says, my land goes all the way up to there. And then he says, you see that irrigation canal. And the American looks, he sees a trickle of water. But the Indian says, my land, all the way up to there. And then he says, what about you? Well, the American is a farmer from Kansas or one of these prairie Midwestern states, you know, where the wheat fields roll on for miles on end. So he clears his throat and says, well, <clears throat> so I, and I get into my tractor and it takes me about a couple of hours to the southern boundary of my land. And then it's about three and a half hours on my tractor to the western boundary of my land. And then I break for a sandwich. And then it takes me about four hours on my tractor to the northern boundary of my land. Um, and at sundown, he says, another couple of hours on my tractor back to my ranch house. So the uh, Indian farmer nods very sympathetically. I know, I know, he said. I too used to have a tractor like that. <laughs> so, so, so the point of telling you that story, other than to make sure you were awake and listening, uh, was that what you understand depends on what your assumptions are. And I, I, I see the skeptical faces here, and I think they're assuming that this organization really isn't amount, doesn't amount to much, hasn't amounted to much, won't amount to much. Uh, and my assumptions are somewhat different, uh, perhaps anchored in a different perspective, and I'll share that with you. Regional associations have a wide variety of users, and it's fair to say they have not all been successful. Many would argue that we haven't fully exploited the potential of IBSA, which I mentioned, or that BRIC, despite the annual meetings of those leaders and the admission of South Africa, remains little more than a clever idea of an analyst at Goldman Sachs. So, so why try and make more of IORARC? Well, let me say that I can't think of many other groupings in which uh, uh, Madagascar can experience, uh, can ex exchange experiences in such a small forum with the uh, sheikhs of the United Arab Emirates and both with India. Uh, for another, the potential of the organization as a forum to uh, to learn from each other, to share experiences, and to pool resources on a variety of issues is real. There are opportunities, as I said, to, to, to learn from each other um, and to pick up issues, waterborne issues, um, as blue water fishing, maritime transport, and of course piracy in the Gulf of Aden and the waters of Somalia, as well as in the Straits of Malacca. But IORARC doesn't have to confine itself to the water. It's the member countries that are members, not just their coastlines. So everything from the development of tourism in the 18 countries to the transfer of science and technology can be on the table. The poorer developing countries have new partners to offer educational scholarships to their young and training courses for their government officers. There's already talk of new projects in capacity building, in agriculture, in the promotion of cultural cooperation. When I was minister, I persuaded Australia to take on the vice chairmanship of IORARC after India, or under India, because it's a troika system where the 
the next chairman is already named vice chairman and accedes to office. India has just uh, taken over the chairmanship um, this year and Australia is in wait. And I persuaded them to do that to ensure that the good work I hoped we would do in the organization would be continued by a like-minded successor. Now, IRARC was in many ways India's brainchild. To let it languish is not just to write off another bureaucratic institution. It is to give up on our leadership of a region that, whether we like it or not, is indispensable to us. To engage with it and seek to revive it will take time, effort, energy, and some resources, not more than 21st century India can afford. IORARC could be the diplomatic arm of a two-pronged two strategy to make Indian Ocean security and political, economic, and cultural cooperation two sides of the same glittering coin. This is why I believe we should not write off its immense possibilities. India must, in my view, pledge itself to energizing and reviving this semi-dormant organization. And while our theme today focuses on Indo-US cooperation, and the US is clearly not geographically eligible for direct involvement in this effort, this may be an area in which discrete support from the US could make a great difference by quietly helping persuade those member countries with which you have good relations, it has good relations, to take the organization more seriously and help make it work in the collective interest. We in India haven't made much of it so far. IRARC has been treading water, not having done enough to get beyond the declaratory phase that marks most new initiatives. The organization itself is lean to the point of emaciation, with just half a dozen staff in its Mauritius Secretariat, including the gardener. <laughs> I visited the rather forlorn-looking headquarters in Port Louis and was concerned at the staff's perception that the member states had not yet accorded adequate priority to the association. So it's clear that IORARC has not yet fulfilled its potential in the decade that it has been in existence. As often happens with brilliant ideas, the creative spark consumes itself in the act of creation, and IRARC has been neglected by its own creators. Indian policymakers have remained focused on the immediate challenge of Pakistan, the headline-grabbing relationships with the US and China, rather than spend time on an area that they see as complex, inchoate, and anything but urgent. The IORARC's formula of pursuing work in an academic group a business forum and a working group on trade and investment has not yet brought either focus or drive to the parent body. But such teething troubles, I would argue, are inevitable in any new group, and the seeds of future cooperation have already been sown. Making a success of an association that unites large countries and small ones, island states and continental ones, Islamic republics, monarchies and liberal democracies, and every race known to mankind represents both a challenge and an opportunity. This very diversity of interests and capabilities can easily impede substantive cooperation, but can also make such cooperation far more rewarding. In this diversity, I, for one, see immense possibilities, and it's time we pledged ourselves seriously to energizing and reviving this, this semi-dormant organization. I call upon the Americans here to recognize the value of this effort to study it, write about it, applaud it, support it, with just enough distance so that your embrace doesn't prove fatal to the effort. <laughs> the brotherhood of man is a tired cliché. The neighborhood of an ocean is a refreshing new idea. The world as a whole stands to benefit if 18 literal states can find common ground in the churning waters of this mighty ocean. Thank you, and Jane. I think there's a handheld mic coming around there, so the gentleman at the back. It uh, probably won't surprise you that the first question should come from an Australian. There you are. Having heard your rousing uh, discourse about IORARC. Um, but with the IORARC, um, do you see any significant change occurring in its charter, for example, over this period of Indian followed by Australian leadership? so that it might, for example, extend to strategic 
and security issues. And I guess the second question, I was recently looking at the list of dialogue partners, noting China and some others there, but not currently the United States. Are you suggesting that the United States should be considered to become a dialogue partner in due course? Thank you. On the second part, the answer is obviously yes. I should have perhaps made that explicitly clear. Um, my understanding is that the US itself has not really taken this very seriously. And as I said on the track record so far, you can't blame Washington. But I do believe that uh, the time has come uh, for us to recognize the potential, the completely unfulfilled potential of this organization. I hope that talking to all of you will help plant the seeds of this thought outside India as well. On the first part of your question, however, um, I am no longer in government and I, it would be inappropriate of me to, uh, to comment on the progress that may or may not have been made. I can only speak for my own vision during my brief stint as vice chairman of the organization. I was quite convinced that this was something we could drive forward for all the reasons I've summarized to you today. And had I remained, I would have made it a priority as part of my portfolio. I think it's safe to say that my successor has not seen it the same way. Uh, our foreign minister himself, the EAM as we call him, did chair uh, the, the uh, IORARC summit in Bangalore a month or two ago. Um, whether there was much substantive outcome from there, I'm honestly not in a position to answer because I haven't actually had the time to look at the documents coming out of it, but I think it's a safe assumption that had there been, we would have heard about it without having to look for it. So uh, I think it's probably true that um, that uh, mine may yet be a fairly lone voice on the subject. But I think you will agree that I've made a compelling case. What I've not been able to invent is the political will to carry out and execute this approach. Uh, and that political will has to come in more than one country. So certainly, I mean, the sort of the salesmanship that I did with Australia to get you guys to instead of going away from an organization you were losing interest in to come in and take on the vice chairmanship would have had to be repeated with most of the other countries in order to ensure that everyone woke up to the potential of it, uh, attended these meetings at, at a more senior level. I'll be very honest with you, when I chaired that, that meeting, I mean, I attended the meeting as vice chair in Sanaa, um, uh, like myself, uh, the bulk of uh, the attendees were ministers of state or deputy ministers, only three or four foreign ministers had bothered to come. Uh, one of which was Iran, which was seeing this as an organization it could use to kind of break free of its relative diplomatic isolation at that time. But I felt if, if Iran could see the potential usefulness of it, that was not an argument for others to stay away, but rather for others to see the same potential. Very, uh, very, very interesting lecture. <laughs> That's an adjective that masks a considerable amount of disagreement, I suspect. Go ahead. <laughs> As a, um, you made an excellent case for the IORARC, but may I say that uh, one of the reasons that it hasn't done as well as it should have was the fact that it was not an inclusive organization, it was kind of exclusive. And it excluded a number of countries who rightfully should have been there. And this morning we've talked about how there are, I think, 31 or 32 literals of the Indian Ocean. And to that, I think we should add the landlocked countries who also depend upon the Indian Ocean. So I suspect we would land up with a figure which is closer to 40 who should be members. However, that's not the case. The second reason I think uh, it did not really work was that security was deliberately kept out for various reasons, political reasons and uh, reasons for various countries uh, you know, who were initiators. The reason I say this was because uh, uh, in my, uh, one of my earlier jobs, I was with the Maritime Foundation. And when we were trying to uh, talk with the Navy, we helped them uh, figure out irons. And irons was deliberately kept out of the ambit of IRARC because IRARC was seen as a moribund organization which was not working. We didn't want something to start something which would again not work. So it was more inclusive. It looked at security. And uh, it's early days yet, but hopefully that will work better. So do you not feel that uh, before I, uh, IORARC can become effective, it needs to be made more inclusive and it needs to look at a more holistic picture of the Indian Ocean? Thank you, sir. No and yes. I think it does need to look at a bigger picture, but I don't think it should become another large organization. In fact, you know, when NATO was created, 
Winston Churchill's Chief of Staff, Lord Ismay, said rather memorably that the composition of NATO was designed to keep the Americans in, the Russians out, and the Germans down. Uh, that, was, that, that was the kind of thing. And, and frankly, I think IORARC, though I was not present at the creation, was also designed, frankly, uh, to keep the Pakistanis and the Chinese out and to ensure that as far as possible, people with a com compatible, not necessarily identical or congruent, but a compatible strategic vision of the ocean would have a common forum within which to get together. Um, now, that's why some will quarrel about the inclusion of Iran, but I think given Iran's position on Pakistan and on Taliban rule of Afghanistan, which was on at that time, I, I think it was not a surprising choice. So my own view is, the second part of your question, should it not start thinking about security, is absolutely right, but it would become far more meaningful as an organization capable of thinking of security if it was a less inclusive, shapeless, amorphous club of everybody and had greater potential of getting people together around common, a common strategic vision of our priorities in, the, in, the, in this region. So I am very much in favor of the present composition, give or take one or two, which uh, small adjustments can always be made. Uh, and I am not in favor of going so large and so broad that it becomes another talk shop. Uh, IONS, frankly, has potential also, but has so far been two talking conferences. One hasn't seen a great deal of tangible outcome from that. I think it's partially because you're not going to get a common security dialogue very easily with some of the participants uh, in there. Uh, whereas uh, I would love to see, and I've, I've always argued that in the long term there can be uh, common interests developed between, say, India and China in the Indian Ocean, maybe even India and Pakistan in the Indian Ocean. Nonetheless, at the moment, uh, that doesn't exist. And so IONS, it seems to me, limits its, its utility other than as a dialogue forum. Whereas IORARC, had it been developed better, and it hasn't been, could actually have turned into a more tangible direction. Uh, I'll be honest with you, since I'm no longer in government, I can say it quite openly, I was hoping to see anti-piracy becoming the thin end of the security wedge. Start off by getting them involved in anti-piracy and then move in from there into the security dimension. And I actually did convene, this is not really a secret, so I'm not revealing anything, I did convene a, a sort of detailed uh, policy discussion in the foreign ministry, which I had uh, attendance from the Foreign Secretary and previous Foreign Secretaries, but also from the Defense Ministry and from a number of think tanks, including the Maritime Foundation and the former Naval Chief of the day. Um, and, and we had a very solid discussion uh, on all of this, very candidly, for about an hour and a half. And I can tell you that in our country, for the Foreign Secretary to devote an hour and a half to a policy discussion is a very rare thing indeed. Uh, and, I mean, it's simply the nature of the job. So, uh, so there was some serious thought being given to all of this, and, and we did prepare a cabinet note. I left around that time, so whether it was moved and what the outcome was, I cannot say. But I thought that there was real potential to take it in the longer term in that direction. So when I speak of reviving this organization, I, I, I don't intend it to be limited to the rather modest and frankly dull areas of discussion it's been focusing on so far. My name is Muhammad Osman, and uh, when I say where I come from, you you get shocked because you'll be taken away by the pirates. Is it is it Maldives or? Uh, well, hold on, Maldives is not well. Well, that's, <clears throat> no. Uh, whenever I heard that I was coming here, I knew that everything would be pirates because Indian Ocean. When you mention, you mention of pirates only. We don't mention of the dumping of the, of the nuclear waste or whatever we have there. But the, but the pirates, uh, we think, because pirates uh, involves I mean, or affects those countries who pass with the ships there carrying their goods. But when, when the dumping comes, they don't care about it. Mm. So uh, we need, we say, to clean that sea to, be, to, uh, to get more prosper from, from it. So if you were now given the chance to solve the problem in the area, where would you start from? Because, you see, I came from Somalia. Oh. So that's... <laughs> I realize you're not I, wearing traditional no, national no, I was, costume. <laughs> no, no, I, was putting, I was putting that thing in the, you know, at the end of my talk. So I wanted you to wonder first, where does this guy come from? 
you know, you take all these uh, 18 states or 17 states around the area, which was the, uh, the place I came from. So if you were, if you were given the key to open that Pandora box, where would you start from? Thank you. Well, to be honest, I do into dumping of nuclear waste off the coast of Somalia or on, yeah, on yeah. land? Or? Yeah, off the coast of Somalia, inside the sea. Hmm. And uh, where we are talking about, we are, even the, where the ships, I mean, the navies are. Because we don't just say, but we have seen them, you know, you know uh, uh, floating after the tsunami, you know, on the sea. But that was, that's not, that's not the, now the case now. Mm -hmm. well, I le leave, it, leave it, don't bother about that. But how, about, how would you solve this crisis of the pirates? If you are... Oh, the pirates, okay. You, well, said, you, nuclear, you, said, you said already you have discussed and made the memo, secret memo and so and so. If you did, wh where, what did you suggest to do to solve the problem? Thank you. Well, uh, first of all, on, on the nuclear thing, I, I, I didn't know about it, so forgive my ignorance, but I think one thing Somalia could do is to take the issue to the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is the UN body that has some responsibility for all matters nuclear, and perhaps nuclear waste dumping could become a new issue on their, on their plate. I, I just wasn't aware of it. On piracy, I mean, I think, I think countries are more or less doing the right thing, but they will have to do a little more. I mean, right now, there's basically two kinds of things happening. There's escorting of commercial vessels in those waters, uh, and there is um, some anti-piracy action. I mean, in fact, India sank what either was a pirate ship or a Thai fishing trawler, I think the jury is still out on that, uh, which, which, they accused of, uh, <laughs> which they accused of having conducted an act of piracy. Uh, and there have, been, there have been that sort of actions in the waters off the coast of, uh, of Somalia. And it seems to me that um, what one needs is more coordinated, more intensive action, but frankly also action on land, because uh, uh, these are, these are chaps who have a fairly comfortable life in Somalia, I understand, beyond the reach of the legally constituted authority such as that is. We all realize the difficulties of, uh, of governance in Somalia. But um, uh, there's not much point uh, in, in reacting to um, uh, an act of piracy if one knows where the source is and cannot reach it. So there are things that need to be done that right now, I mean, there isn't a, an alliance capable of taking that on. Indeed, I'm not sure that the government of Somalia, whether or not its rich extends to that area, would be prepared to, um, to countenance that sort of action. But broadly speaking, those are things that need to be done. On the actual escorting and attacking, um, perhaps a more systematic uh, campaign with uh, an alliance of navies, a sharing of duties, uh, in a much more organized and coordinated way. Many, many countries are essentially freelancing out there and not not doing it as part of a combined effort, might create a slightly, a slightly higher uh, success rate. And then uh, some serious action with Somalia, maybe through assistance to the Somali government to actually, um, to actually get rid of these chaps' uh, bases on land. Uh, but that's a layman's uh, approach, and I don't claim to have any, any, anything more to contribute than those general ideas. And right at the back. My name is uh, Malik Mamani. I'm a part of uh, Observer Research Foundation, the Mumbai chapter. And uh, uh, I am a civil service aspirant, so naturally I've been uh, trained to conform only to what's on paper. So please correct my theoretical approach if at all it is. Uh, I believe that uh, we are very conservative in uh, appointing diplomats. And uh, are we ignoring bilateral relationship building and being proactive in uh, regular uh, interactions between our partners, for example, around the Indian Ocean Rim. So is it because of which, one, we fail to elicit cooperation in multilateral forums, which often become ritualistic in their approach of getting together, having good rhetoric, and then getting back to their places? Is it that we're ignoring bilateral relations at a very heavy cost? Actually, it's the other way around. We, 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 our diplomats tend to focus on bilateral relationships and don't expend much energy on their multilateral dimension. So you will find that we have pretty good bilateral relations with each of these 18 member countries, or 17 since we are one of the 18. But I don't think that any of our ambassadors in those countries is spending a whole lot of time thinking about, let alone mentioning or talking about, IORARC. So that when these countries are actually showing up in Bangalore, or before that in Sanaa, 
they aren't coming having been primed by the Indian ambassador to think of this as important and to, and to think forward. So they're essentially coming with, frankly, fairly tired and predictable um, uh, statements which, which uh, are, by and large, underwhelming and uninspiring. So the problem is the opposite of what you've diagnosed. There, is, there are adequate bilateral relations, but one has to be able to leverage one's bilateral relations for multilateral purposes. That requires leadership from the capital, in our case, New Delhi, to tell them that this is a priority for us and we want them to raise this issue in their, in their meetings with the, the right levels in those countries so that the ministers or the ministers of state traveling to the conference come primed uh, with, with, with that kind of orientation. Whether that's been happening enough, frankly, I don't believe it has. From Australia again. Um, sorry to have a second uh, bite of this cherry. But don't worry, you've done that on the cricket field already. So. <laughs> uh, well, there you go. Ba bad luck is all I can say. Um, but I'm not going to ask you how to solve the Indian cricket problem. I'll leave that to others. Um, so no, you mentioned the word leadership, and I, and I guess seeing as, you, seeing as you put it out there, uh, I'll ask the question, um, why is there an apparent reluctance on the part of India to exercise leadership? And I say that coming from an Indian Ocean littoral perspective. Um, my colleague... Um, Rahij Sohini mentioned IONS, and, and I was lucky enough to attend the, the last IONS in Abu Dhabi. But again, a, a great idea, but the, it seems to be already labouring under, under um, a reluctance of India to follow through on its initiative with exerting the sort of leadership that it needs to energise and, and, and take it forward with Australia, South Africa, Indonesia, etc. being involved. But I just wonder why... The, this apparent lack of uh, willingness to, to step forward and take the leadership role. Thank you. This is not, I think you've diagnosed uh, a problem. I think that, um, I think that this uh, is a phenomenon that cuts across, um, cuts across many areas of, of international endeavor uh, where we have been somewhat cautious or, as our earlier question has said, conservative uh, in our approach on issues. And... Um, I'm personally of the view that we can be a lot more proactive. Um, I spent 11 months in office being very proactive, and I'm not sure I've gotten a lot of, lot of thanks, but I think it can be done. I think the system can be moved. But, um, but whether it has been sufficiently on this issue or other issues, um, I think you will find that there, there is more than one view on that. And uh, I'm not going to stand here and anatomize it for you, but I will say that, um, that certainly on some issues we could do more, and I think voices... Uh, in Parliament and outside Parliament need to push uh, in that direction, you know, whichever government is in office. But I'm in a particularly invidious position as a former uh, minister uh, of, of, of a ministry that would play a key role in this, and I, I would rather leave my answer right there. Thank you all very much. Now, the only thing that stands between you and the bar is a closing, uh, the closing remarks and a word of thanks by Jim. And I, my remarks are standing between us and the food outside. Uh, but, but it's appropriate that on behalf of the uh, Observer Research Foundation and the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies, and primarily on behalf of all the participants of our conference this week, we would like to thank uh, you, sir, Sashi, for these uh, as compelling arguments for us to look at organizations that are already existent and not necessarily going off on grand ideas of creating institutions that perhaps can already be accomplished by those that have been thought of before. So thank you very much for that thoughtful compliment to the discussions that were going on today. And I can assure you, uh, based upon my brief knowledge of our participants, these are comments that will be taken wholeheartedly into the discussions that remain for this week. So on behalf of all of us, thank you very much for those thoughtful comments.